I can go, I can go, it's time. Thank you very much. I don't want to say that we kept the best for, uh, for the end because that would be unfair for many of the other events and many other, other speakers, but I can tell you you're not going to regret staying all the way until the end. We have an awesome program. We're going to have two absolutely fantastic keynote speaker uh, and then uh, a little pause. I think we really need to thank everybody who's contributed to this event, starting with all of you. And after that, please stay until the end. We have uh, a little surprise. So our first keynote speaker tonight is a dear friend. In fact, uh, Robbie Schindler uh, was one of the first keynote speaker at the first Understanding Risk four years ago. At that time, he was, uh, we used to call them one of these whiskies working at NASA on the uh, concept of new micro satellites. Uh, two years ago, we invited him to come to uh, Understanding Risk in Cape Town, and he couldn't show up because he was plotting something. He, he was, they were very busy in those days. Uh, since then, Robbie has left NASA and with a bunch of friends started Planet Lab, which is a, a fantastic new concept using microsatellite. He's going to tell, tell us all about it and how it's going to help us in our work to better understand and monitor risk. Robbie Schengler. Thanks, Francis. Can you guys hear me? Yes? Excellent. So, um, wow, what a, what a couple of days. This is fantastic. I, I was at the first Understanding Risk. Um, it was a little bit of an experiment to do these lightning talks and to have a lot of concurrent sessions and to really create a program that allows for the conversations to happen between sessions, right? the ideas to foster and the collaboration to, to come up with. And it's great to see the juxtaposition four years later and how it's just, it's old hat, it's commonplace. This is how you guys do things. So that's fantastic. What a great, what a great couple of days. So um, I do have a confession to make. I'm, I'm a physicist. I'm, I worked at NASA for most of my career and I'm actually not in the development community at all. Um, so I think some of my remarks are going to come from a different perspective. And um, one of the key messages that I would like to get out to you guys is that new data are coming. And new tools to process these data are coming online. It very well may come from us. Hopefully, it will come from us. But there are multiple startups that, um, that are thinking through doing things differently in aerospace that really is going to have a profound impact on the data and the tools that communities such as the Understanding Risk community can actually utilize. So that's the key message that I want to get across. And in doing so, I'm going to tell you a bit about the state of aerospace and why it is ripe for disruption right now, kind of through the lens of, of our story at Planet Labs. So this image is the blue marble. This image was taken in 1972, um, the last human mission to the, to the moon, um, fully illuminated as astronauts were going to the moon. It's, the, it's an iconic photo. Uh, it really did um, spur a bit of the environmental community and the green movement to see uh, the state of the world as, as one home, one place, with no borders and against the against the blackness of space and the fragility of our planet. Um, and it really did spark kind of this global awareness about what's happening. Um, and uh, this is actually what draw me to NASA. So um, I worked at NASA for about 10 years. And um, this, in the state of aerospace, since the Cold War ended, hasn't really changed a whole lot. Uh, it is a strategic industry. It's about $300 billion a year of activities for 70 launches. So if you think about that, that's $400 million for every one rocket that goes up. And that means if you're in aerospace, your satellites have to work, right? And so at NASA, I worked on a number of missions to try to bring about a new way of thinking 
into aerospace, small satellites, to take risk a little bit differently. And I loved it. NASA is a phenomenal place. I was there for about 10 years. Um, it was a childhood dream uh, to work at NASA, some of the best and brightest people um, on the planet. And it actually is a great place to be if you're an entrepreneur because all of their missions are competitively selected. So you have to pitch your idea for a new scientific mission that you're going to do. And you get a little bit of money, and then you prove that you can really do it. Then they give you some more, uh, then a bit more and some more. And before you know it, it's a half billion dollar mission. So this is how the aerospace community is kind of locked in this vicious cycle of risk aversion, um, very, very infrequent um, launches to space and requires for satellites to work. So <clears throat> I was working at a research center in uh, California called NASA Ames. And around this time, Google came up with the Nexus One. So the Nexus One phone had, was the first phone that had an open source operating system. And if you think about what's in a smartphone today, it's about the same subsystems that you need in a satellite a fast processor, a camera, batteries, radio, rate gyro, accelerometer, every single thing that you actually need to have a remotely operated vehicle, which is all that a satellite is, are miniaturized and in something this big that costs $400. Why do satellites have to cost $400 million? So um, a couple of friends and I, and over the summer, got some interns and didn't do it as a formal project, but we called it PhoneSat. And this literally was putting in a phone diagonally inside this 10 centimeter cube box. This is a form factor that university students came up with called the CubeSat. We added additional things into it like more batteries, more power, a brighter radio so that we can communicate with it over long distances. And we put it through all the rigors that we do at NASA, shake table and vibe table to withstand the launch environment to uh, putting it on um, a high altitude balloon here in order to test remote uh, communications with it, and then also up on sounding rockets. And it worked. So it turns out a phone is a terrible satellite, but the components inside here are extremely robust. And, um, and so with that recognition and knowing that at NASA, we, and I still kind of say we, but uh, the, the NASA community and the aerospace community doesn't know how to take risk that way. If, if, they can f if satellites fail, that's actually a big deal for NASA. So um, we knew that we had this technology and the ability to build these teams, but we were looking for a big, hairy problem to solve. And <clears throat> what bigger problem to solve than the state of the planet, right? We are, at, we are at a very dangerous place on the planet. We, uh, we are outside of the bounds of, 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 of getting back into balance. And humans are, are actually the root cause of a lot of these imbalances on the Earth. Uh, whether it's um, massive urbanization, flooding to cities, to deforestation in the Amazon, to other places, the degradation of the Earth's forests, um, stress, on, uh, th that, that's happening with uh, natural resources like water. Uh, we have food insecurity due to overpopulation and extreme weathers. Um, our infrastructure, civic infrastructure, is, is not as resilient as we actually need it to be with all uh, extreme weather as well as massive amount of people um, um, making their way to cities. And we have, you know, for the first time, new types of re refugees, people that are refugees from climate change. And in fact, everywhere that you look on the planet, things are changing. And things are changing out of balance. So this brings me back to this picture. This picture is, is beautiful, but it's incomplete. Right? It's, a, it's a moment. It's, it's one snapshot. And it doesn't actually show what is really happening on our planet, because our planet is dynamic. Um, 1972 is also a time when NASA launched a mission called Landsat. And Landsat uh, is a, a phenomenal program that's been going for the last 40 years. They've launched eight satellites over that time. And uh, they, they collect imagery of the land um, on the Earth. And that's 30 meters per pixel updated every 16 days. 
And 30 meters per pixel, what that means is uh, you can see, like if you look at a football pitch, that's three pixels next to each other. So that's the spatial resolution that it sees, it sees that globally every 16 days. So it's actually really cool. It's a global good, right? Google did some great work um, with NASA by taking this archive data over the last 40 years and visualizing that, seeing the forest shrink and seeing the cities expand. Uh, it's, it's, it's phenomenal for scientists to really understand what's happening on, on our planet or what we are doing to it. But it isn't high enough resolution and it isn't um, updated frequently enough in order for us and everyone here to make better decisions and more data-driven decisions. Decisions based on the state of the world as it is today, not an old mental model about what we think it was um, when it was years ago. So um, now we have a problem, and we have also have solved, um, have a technology, have a solution. So the basic idea is if you can disaggregate the satellite into multiple little satellites, you can come up with new mission concepts that weren't possible before. So our mission at Planet Labs is to image the entire Earth every day at three to five meters per pixel. So that's every day, and three to five meters per pixel is so that you can see a tree, but you can't see people, right? So no personally identifiable information, um, but actually down fine-grained enough in order to actually see the effect of change over time and how decisions are made. So we left NASA. This is a picture um, of the founding team in my garage three years ago. You can see in the lower right-hand corner is a satellite. Uh, that's how big it is, this little guy right there next to Ben. And uh, we started prototyping, convincing ourselves that we could actually build this thing and it could work. And uh, we went out and decided to do this mission because it has a lot of technical risk involved. Uh, we, we got venture capital funding to do it. But the primary core of what we're doing is we want to enable a transparent planet. And we want to actually change the way that people understand context and the state of the world so that we can actually really recognize where we are as a species and then help us make better decisions. So here's an example on how big our satellite is in comparison to a gigantic satellite. Uh, this is approximately to scale. Our satellites are this big. They are five kilograms about the size of a shoebox. And traditional satellites, again, exquisite. They work, they're multispectral, they're extremely reliable, um, and they're super high resolution. Uh, they're the size of a, of, a, of a school bus, and they cost about half a billion dollars. So this is a digital globe satellite, it's Worldview 2, uh, and they have approximately singles of these satellites in space, about five. Um, and our satellites are much smaller, which then means that we can launch a lot of them for the same mass and then again, come up with new missions. And some of them don't have to work, but enough of them have to work in order to get useful data. So we set out to um, prove that we could actually build this very capable spacecraft in a really, really small form factor. And uh, we practice something that we kind of took from the Silicon Valley and software development community, which is agile development, but we brought it to aerospace. So we call it agile aerospace. And every two to three months, our engineers build a brand new satellite. And the satellite works end to end. In fact, if there was a launch ready to go that day, we would put it on the launch to test how it works in space. And that's what we did in April of last year. We launched our first two satellites. That was Build 4 and Build 6. Uh, these were tech demo satellites to just prove that the thing can work in space. And they worked. And then in, in, in November of last year, we launched another two more, that was Build 7, and uh, then we mass produced Build 7 into something called Flock 1, which looks like this. This is 28 satellites, which is the world's largest constellation of imaging spacecraft. And this one we hitched a ride through a partner, launch partner called NanoRacks, to the International Space Station. Not humans, but the, it went up as cargo. And uh, these satellites uh, went up to the International Space Station in January, uh, the astronauts unloaded them out of cargo, put them on a pallet attached to a robotic arm through, uh, through, out through an airlock, and ejected them two at a time in February of this year. 
And this is a picture taken from an astronaut of our two satellites, two of 28, coming off from the International Space Station. So this is some of the smallest satellites ever built by humanity launched from the largest, most expensive satellite ever built by humanity. Um, and this is really cool because normally in space you don't get video, you don't get images of your spacecraft when you actually launch these things into space. The last time you see them is when you, when you, when you bolt it to the upper stage of the launch vehicle. Uh, so this is actually really, really quite, um, quite awesome to get this type of footage. The additional thing is these are demo constellations. We're still iterating on our technology. And it's not just the hardware, but it's also the ground stations, right, and mission control in order to operate all of these spacecraft. Um, and, uh, and they fly really low. They fly at 400 kilometers, and they have to be designed to fly beneath the space station. So they only last about six months before they burn up in the upper atmosphere. But we learned a lot from it. So here's our mission. This is our mission one. This is to image the whole Earth every day. It's in a special orbit that's called a sun-synchronous orbit. And with about 100 satellites, it effectively creates a line scanner as the Earth rotates underneath it and captures images of the planet. And looking at the engineering solution for that, the satellites do the same thing all the time. So it's actually really simple. It's just looking down, taking a picture, storing it, when it's over a ground station, transmitting it. So we've launched 43 doves over the last 16 months. Uh, we call our satellites Dove um, because this is a humanitarian mission at the core of what we're doing. Most aerospace missions are more military oriented and they typically name them after birds of prey, but ours is called Doves. Um, and over the next uh, 18 months, we'll launch more than 100 more satellites. Um, and also a lot of this imagery that you see in the back um, are imagery that has come down from our demonstration satellites. So there are two things that I wanted to highlight um, that's a bit of a differentiator for what our product actually is and, um, and what other people are also thinking about doing in, in space in order to get useful, meaningful, actionable data. Um, we do a, a monitoring mission, right, the line scanner, so we capture everywhere. Satellites today do a tasking mission, right, where they point off Nader and they take a picture for, for a customer. So it's a point and shoot methodology. And therefore, you have limited observations. And if you're looking over there, you miss all of this other area over here. Uh, you have to pay a lot of money to look over there. So you kind of have to know to look for something. So you miss all the serendipitous things that are actually happening. Um, and it's quite expensive because there's a lot of humans in the loop. And so our system is an always on operation where um, we capture everything. So that means we can actually see serendipitous events um, and go back in the archive over time to do some forensic analysis around things. I have almost the, the final word amongst this wonderful community which um, Francis and Emma and Alana and the others have created over the last four years. I mean, it really is a remarkable group of friends and as we are about to set sail again from our lovely three days of docking here well actually we've got another two days of course well we're going to take sail down to UCL um, I just want to share with you some very very personal direct thoughts about where we are and where we have to go next in time for you are in two years time um, I put a slide up um, because I'm very lucky. I'm very lucky because for a set of unusual reasons, I sit on all sorts of odd committees and, and bodies. In science, in capital, I work in the city of London, I work for a big global reinsurer, and because of a strange set of circumstances, also in public policy in the United Kingdom and around the world. And because of that, I'm, as many of you who work with me know, I'm no modeler. I'm no actuary, but I just take part in an awful lot of conversations. And what I want to share with you is my digest of what those conversations mean 
and why the folks in this room and those who were here a little earlier are so absolutely fundamentally important to the journey we have to take for the reasons that those of you in the Guild Hall were around, Jeff Sachs, The Economist, told us about. But also, if I may, the communities that we absolutely must have on our journey between now and 2016, wherever that may be. But the very last item on that list has been the one that has been most profound for me uh, in the last few weeks. I was lucky enough to be elected to the governing board of the local primary school where Anna and my two children are, aged four and six. And I did it for a variety of reasons. It's a school that's good, but it can get a bit better, and maybe I can, I can add a bit to it. And we've got very personal reasons to want to make a contribution. And I sat down, and I was invited to an assembly as a governor, the first one, two weeks ago. I know it's a very trite thing we do this for our children and our children's children. I sat down in a seat, looking out at a sea of faces, just like you, but a bit younger. It's a big primary school in a mixed part of northwest London, Kensal Rise. There are 700 children from the ages of three to about 11. And they represent every, every color, every nationality, every tribe you can imagine. They are even more, frankly, diverse than the audience I'm looking at right now. And they start about this high, and they get up about this high, and they're in their gray and purple uniforms and they're looking at me with big, wide, open eyes. And they are the most incredibly innocent group of people who will hopefully all be here in 2100. And you just look at the hope that this school is trying to give these children, some of whom don't come from as privileged backgrounds, and you realize, because of what we know, the sort of world that those innocent faces don't know they are probably going to inhabit. And it is profoundly moving. And you say to yourself, someone has to do something about this. And you realize that actually, for a set of reasons, you are one of those people with a set of friends. It is tremendous. It's what we're here for. <laughs> so this is what I think. This is the truth. This is the real economy. In 2050, we will have, as we all know, 9 billion richer, middle class, longer living, coastal, urban, connected people. We all know that. And because we are human beings, we want to have more land, water, shelter. You know all this stuff, okay? You do. So I'm not going to bore you with it. You've, you, you're experts. But that's, that's the brutal truth. And we all know about the real global economy because we're all experts. So I'm not going to bore you with that, because you know all this stuff. And you know about these global norms, but you know they're expressed at local, city, national, regional parameters. And you know where they will be, where you are, by 2050. You know that, and you know where the extremes will be. And like most of us, you probably hope that someone will do something about it, and it'll be all right, because we have the technical knowledge to do something about it. That's what we all, even I, deep down, hope and believe. And you also know that actually these changes are beyond reasonable doubt, which is the legal definition from, in some places, being able to kill someone legally. And they passed the legal, legal balance of balance of probabilities decades ago, even in my first year of geography at Durham. But you all know that, so I'm not going to bore you with that. I'm going to go very quickly here. One of the most shocking things I, I went to was in Korea last uh, September to the triennial um, World Energy Congress Summit on the Future of Energy. I'm going to tell you some things which perhaps you don't know. I sort of knew, but God, when there were 6,000 people there from the world of energy, passionate about sustainability, actually they're then all sort of just wanting to sell more oil. But I learned some brutal truths about the future of energy consumption on the back of those demographic figures, which frankly gave me more panic than I would ever imagine. So 
The bottom line of this graph is, this is a good news story, if someone said to me, by 2045, we will be burning 50% more fossil fuels than we are now, I'd take that offer. And you know what that means. If someone offered me that now, and I'm a risk monger, I would absolutely take that offer. And you know what that means for the very, for the, and we are at the sharp end of what that means. Everyone talks broadly about climate change. And that's like a big issue. Disasters are not such a big issue. They're micro. Climate change. Climate change is expressed through what we're doing. It's extremes. And I'll tell you why 50% for me would be a good offer. So there is absolutely no foreseeable, within the next 100 years, peak oil. Even with the, even with the, uh, uh, e even with the challenges of, of the growth of demand, I thought there was peak oil about 10 years away. There isn't. There's absolutely no shortage of the cardinal crown jewel fuel, which is so incredibly rich that it's, it's difficult to um, avoid. It's mobile, it's, fine, it's in energy intensive. Natural gas, traditional or in the unconventional shale gas terms, it's significantly less carbon intensive. And yes, of course, it can represent a nice transition gas. A transition fuel, but that's effectively limitless as well. And we all know what that's doing to the price of energy. And then we say, oh, right, well, we can get over that with carbon capture and storage. Forget it. From all the research I've looked at, there is no commercial angle towards cap carbon capture and storage at a scale that would be effective in the kind of agenda that I've just described. It's wishful thinking. Renewables, yeah. That's going to be significant. We've got our fair share of wind farms and the rest of it. But even at the most ad ambitious estimates, it could not represent more than 30% of global energy consumption. Nuclear power, <laughs> for reasons which we know about, they may not be rational, nuclear power in many parts of the world has now become politically infeasible. I spent, because I'm so, I thought, well, maybe it's all about fusion. Maybe it's the last hope we got. So I sat for half a day with the global experts on the fusion. They've got great big, they've got great big sort of 10 billion pound experiments going in France called ITER, and all this. Fusion before 2050, it won't even get beyond the experimental stage before 2050. So don't think fusion's the answer. I hope it, I hope it will be but not in the sort of timescales that we're thinking about at Ark Franklin Primary Academy in Northwest London. So that's the first tragedy. That's what I've described. Tragedy of the global commons. We all know about these, these sorts of problems. Um, uh, the, the demand side and all the rest of it. I'm looking at the right, I need to go down here. I can't read from behind, it's too late. But what we've also realized, we have it here in the United Kingdom. As soon as the price of fuel, so we've got, to, we've got to ration this stuff. We've got to stop people burning it. But as soon as you have the slightest issues about cost growth or rationing, the political economy does not work. And, I, and all, that, all those conservation agendas and everything I'm describing here as potential reductions are included in my best offer of 50% more. Carbon markets, you tell me. For the exact political economy I've described, they're not working either. And I see absolutely, in all the committees I sit in, I see no prospect of carbon markets being effective. Meanwhile, <laughs> the laws of physics reign supreme. And you know that better than I do. A constant, unmitigating, unrelenting, ratcheting up of the risk, which is expressed through the punctuation marks which you know all about. And Geography 101, first year Durham, global equilibrium and systems, we all know what this means. And it will be relentless. And I think, personally, it will begin to speed up because the, because the rate of change of extremes, for some reason, always seems to be uh, accelerating. 
here is perhaps the beginning of a solution. And how do I follow Robbie? But I do see a slight bit of genius, maybe, in Francis's thinking. Because Robbie has the, has the route to the art. He's got one half of the answer. We are about to enter what I call the new romantic period. The romantic period of literature was when man was connected. We, we industrialized the United Kingdom in about 1820s. Everyone was concerned we weren't becoming at one with nature emotionally. We were, we were coming into the cities. And you had this romantic movement in literature where poets like Wordsworth and Shelley would write about nature to try and reconnect the, urban, the urbanizing community with, with, their, their, with their essence. And ultimately, man won, and we entered our cities, and we pretty much for, forgot about nature. And the romantic period of literature in music and art died. It's right up the capital R. Ironically, the people in this room are the only hope we have to reconnect with nature through the new romantic period, but not yet through art and poetry and music, although I'm sure that will happen in the, in the next UR. It's through the modelled world, the modelled and the mapped world, and how that environmental modelling and mapping through Robbie's incredible innovations and others will intersect not with our emotions directly from the page, but through capital, capital and law. And as we see the relationship between capital and the environmentalism through this wonderful medium we have the model world, maybe we can reconnect um, with nature. Because the, the brutal truth is we're in this marriage and we can't get out of it. And we all know who ultimately is the biggest partner. And that level of risk will begin to rise up. So as we all know, there is no longer nature. There is only anthro-nature. It's our marriage that we're now part of, and we have to get right. But the marriage isn't what it was. For 150 years, we've been, we've been in charge as man. But now the lady is fighting back. And she's telling us that we have to change our mindset, and we have to change it very quickly. But we're going to carry on burning 50% more fossil fuels. I've touched on this already. But ultimately, it's the gearbox of the modelled world and its impact firstly on capital, but then excitingly, as Anna touched on in, in the Guild Hall yesterday, that because of our science, the basic human rights of life, livelihood, sustenance and shelter those basic rights through the Human Rights Commission and other legal processes, litig litigation processes, those basic rights and duties of cities and states and even companies through the OECD now operate through disasters. Because most, all, pretty much all hydrometeorological disasters are predictable and foreseeable, at least with some few days' notice, and even seismic risk is at least accessible. The political and legal levers are about to have to be applied, and they will, but only through your gearboxes, only if we can link up your worlds with Oasis and RMS1 and all the rest of it. Because if we don't do that, we are in a bad state. I've touched on this. I don't want to go there anymore. But relentlessly, anthro-nature will become more influential year by year, five years by five years. Where will we be in 2030? I have some thoughts. We've done this before, but here are some important inflection points which I think allow us in the next two years to change things. The release of AR4, I thought the reaction to that was remarkable. There's really no more debate about climate change. Everyone basically accepted that. That's absolutely fine. This relentless theme of resilience has finally at last united us all around a word and a concept that it may be not slightly amorphous but it's a damn sight more useful for me at the moment than sustainability i can use relent i can use resilience my wife probably wanted to marry a resilient man i don't know if you want to marry a sustainable man but hey resilience sounds good we want to be resilient resilient cities so there we go and it allows us to bring our worlds together, financial, physical, and the rest resilience. 
2030 is a pivotal junction point. We have all these critical processes. Such a privilege to work for the, until now, relatively unknown Hyogo framework. Hyogo framework is going to allow us to triangulate, basically, this is the big deal. We are going to triangulate energy into energy and risk through disasters, but driving energy and the environment into capital and law, not through Paris, not through sustainability, through the Hyogo framework. We will do it through that framework. And when we do it through that framework, we have achieved an enormous step forward to try it, because we can't do it any other way, only through Hyogo. But we have these other punctuation marks, which are absolutely dependent upon Hyogo. And that is dependent, Hyogo only works if people believe, and these deals will believe. That's what the Guild Tool event was about last night. They will only do it if they think the informational ecosystem is there. Because from my political sort of access, I'm pretty sure about one thing. If we get to January 2016 and there is absolutely no significant multilateral deal on climate and its related things, the only sensible political and economic response for countries, regions, cities and companies is to say, it's every city and country for themselves, pretty much. They will, it's the only rational response. You have to go into ultra-resilience mode. And the overall capacity of the system, of our human system, will be eroded. So the next, the journey between now and the next UR is absolutely critical. And that's why the lawyers and the finance folks, as well as the politicians, I'm glad to see some here, are so important. The ultimate inflection point is UR 2016, in some senses. What I've noticed about these big dates in the diary is, and we had a bit, bit of one last night, and we've got, is you can use them as mobilizing forces. We have to think tomorrow who we need. Well, basically, we need to know what we need to, this group to drive in EOGO needs to, but we need to think who we need to have at UR 2016, and we need to do that, that planning now. We need to know that Mark Carney will be there. We need to know that Christine Lagarde will be there. We need to know that the supremes of, of, of legal processes, of, of litigation, will be there. It's gone beyond our world now. We can inform it, but we've got to basically turn the vice. You got the hint on the political champions group. Oh, political champions, it was a fantastic panel, but it isn't all about bloody risk management. We've got great risk modelling in North America, in the UK. Do we have great catastrophe risk policies? No. We've got enough data already to make some big decisions. I wasn't, wasn't entirely impressed up with that, I have to say. Back to the future. I'm going to plug a little plug for insurance, actually, but actually, it's actually a word for capital. The climate change issue of the 19th century, in fact, it had been since the 16th century. London burned down in 1666, was urban fire. Urban fire destroyed whole communities, and it just was relentless. And it happened in the 19th century as America urbanized and mass migration and industrialization. The cities got bigger. But every few years, well, every, every year, some would burn. And people would say, oh, well, it's just you know, Chicago got it this year, or Los Angeles got it this year, or Wichita got it this year. It would happen again and again and again. But what can you do about it? It's so complicated. Houses were made of straw and cotton and no zoning. It was, uh, it was too difficult. And anyway, we can't tell people what to do. It's a free, it's a free country. 1871, some weather system went across the states from west to east. And there were five major urban fires. I think it was Milwaukee, Chicago. Massive fires in one week. It got to the tipping point. It was so bad. Thousands of people died of all classes, even those who went to the fields. Tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, probably, of properties and homes were destroyed, rich and poor. But the most concerning issue, do you know what it was? It wasn't those lives lost. It was the productive and economic capacity of the United States. People said, because it was the factories that burned and the offices and the administration, that's what really hurt. And the investors said, we cannot go on like this. What should we do? And they said, but it's so difficult. What should we do? So they went to a very weak Washington in 1872. And they went to Washington and said, what should we do? And they said, we know what we should do. We should go to the company set up by the founding fathers like Franklin and churches. We'll go to the insurance people 
set up by, you know, they had rocket scientists of the day. They knew, they knew how to do maths. They'll tell us what to do. So they went away and they said, we need an underwriting code. For two years, they did the research on the claims, on the weather, on the engineering. They came back two years later and they said, here's your underwriting code. Oh, thank you very much. Now everyone can be covered by insurance. I said, oh, no, no, no. They said, well, it's not just about the insurance, it's about the homeowners doing certain things, it's about the factory owners behaving in a certain way. There has to be an institution of behaviour. They said, but we can't tell people what to do. They said, well, otherwise capital won't be protected. If we don't protect capital, then it's, it's not going to be sustainable. They said, but we can't. They said, that's the price of resilience and sustainable growth. They didn't say that, but that's what they meant. They said, can we have an underwriting code? And I said, no. They said, but why not? They said, because it's not just about the factory and it's also about the city and the state, Leanne. It's about zoning laws and building codes and actually a fire department every three miles. They said, but that'll cost money. We can't tell people what to do. They said, ah, but that's the kind of resilience, sustainable growth. And then finally, they said, can we have our underwriting? They said, no. They said, but why not? They said, well, actually, because if Boston burns, the Massachusetts uh, industry will be destroyed and people won't be paid and it will be unsustainable. We need to share this risk across America and even with our friends in Munich like Anselm and, and others. We need to have this global ultra community product called reinsurance invented in Cologne. They said, we have, we'll have to have standards across America. We're a, we're a group of federal states. We have to agree. And do you know what? Over 50 years, and people have been saying that over the next 50 years we'll build more in the developing world than we have in all of history, probably 10 times more, but over the next 50 years urban morphology, urban landscapes were completely transformed by the silly laws in an insurance contract and the power of capital. We live in a capitalist system. The clue's in the word. That's who needs to be here in two years' time. This is one idea. One thing we've learned in our world, where in 25 years ago we suffered an existential crisis due to disasters, stress tests. Let's make all of capital in the public and private sector have to fulfill and report on a one in a hundred stress test. I want to know Christchurch's one in a hundred year stress test. I want to know London's one in a hundred, not hundred years ahead, next year. For companies, for businesses, for mortgages, for everything. And risk will be effectively punished. It will become less attractive said to me, we will have created this level of knowledge, be putting micro-satellites into space, have this community of friends who trust each other, I would have bitten your hand off. But you know what? I'm going to raise the bar. I'm going to say we've achieved that, but now things are even more urgent. And we have to take that friendship, we have to take that trust, we have to take that community, and now we have to move forward at speed to the communities we've just described and use these punctuation marks in the agenda. It has been such a privilege to be part of this community, and I know I and many others will do everything we can over the next two years to take this, this great ship and head out into space and be able to look down at this planet and say, you know what, those kids in Kendall Rise School and your kids and all the rest of them, they can look forward to 2100, and it's not going to be easy, it's going to be bloody difficult. It's not going to be a pleasant world in 2100, but it might at least be, broadly speaking, sustainable. Thank you. hand over to Francis Gessier, and I dare say he's going to give some thank yous to some people who deserve it. He's such a bashful chap, he probably won't thank himself, so I'm going to do it for him. Francis, I don't know how you thought about this you are brand and lifestyle choice. I don't know if you were in the bath for six years ago, I don't know where you were, but thank God you did, and thank God you have the gumption to do it and hire a team who can pull it off and have a platform at the World Bank who can basically make us all think we better be there for the first one. And once we went to the first one, we were hooked. Francis, your leadership has been phenomenal. And your ability to pick a team is exceptional. On behalf of all of us, thank you. But please, I implore you, don't stop leading the good ship you are for at least another four years. Thank you.
Thank you. Thank you very much, Rowan. And indeed, instead of having keynote address, maybe we should have master lectures uh, from now on and, and, and uh, invite a prominent speaker. This was uh, masterful. And Rowan pointed before our last uh, little cherry on the cake for uh, this UR forum, I'm left with one important thing to do, which is really to thank every one of you for coming and contributing to this event. I think, uh, I think we all deserve all a big round of applause. I think. <laughs> As I said at the beginning, you are, you are, you are understanding risk. Uh, so all of you have contributed. I, I'm not going to go through a list, another list of names, because it's impossible. I want to thank all the speakers, all the people who have participated in the sessions. It's been a, a tremendous engagement. You are is, is not just us. It's really all of, all of you and all of us. Uh, we, we just give the space and people organize the sessions, and I think it worked tremendously well. I want to thank our sponsors, because without their sponsorship, there wouldn't be any you are. Uh, and these are, of course, UCL Willis and the World Bank, uh, the GFDR ACP EU program, S3, uh, RMS, and Google. And then there's a whole list of partners, but uh, you've seen their logos everywhere. I won't, I won't uh, uh, read them. I want to thank the UR team, all the red shirts you've seen around. I think they've been <laughs> fantastic. I want to thank, of course, Alana and Angela, and, but I'm, I can't really go through. You are when exist without these two women, and so I, we have some little present for them. Alana, the whole UR team, thank you very, very much. I, I actually want to thank my direct boss, who's Zubida Alao, who's in the back, who's actually giving me all the space to, to, to do this. She, she kind of looks the other way, and we, we do all these things, which is not, you know, I think at the World Bank, they sometimes wonder what we're smoking uh, in organizing all this, but she, she gives us all the space to do this, and I want to I wanna give her credit for that. Now, at the last UR, we closed with this fantastic event uh, where we invited those African drummers to teach us drumming and to demonstrate that we can actually all work in unison, that we can all work uh, towards the same goal and, and, and create this incredible music uh, that, that uh, was possible with African drum. And so we, we thought about, what, what are we going to do? We're, what can we do in London? Can, what can we offer the participants of, of uh, you are coming to London that is typical to, to Great Britain? And we thought about it, and when we, we got to one conclusion, we're going to give them chicken tikka masala. <laughs> we're going to give them some Indian drumming. And so uh, I'm going to invite...